Was my mic muted that whole time? Yes. <laughs> That's the first time I've done that. Thank you for letting me know. Okay, let's start over. <laughs> it, it was bound to happen eventually. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you, uh, everyone, for your patience there. Uh, tonight, uh, we're here with our latest installment in the Garland County Master Gardeners Know It to Grow It program series. And I'm here with Judy Dare, who is the chairperson of the Garland County Master Gardeners. And tonight's program is about healing gardens, and it's going to feature a special guest, Minnie Sheeler, who's with Garvin Woodland Gardens. And Judy's going to give her a formal introduction here in just a moment. But uh, we both have a few announcements to make tonight. Um, what I was just showing you on the screen and, and talking about, but you couldn't hear me, uh, we have our fishing derby this weekend at Family Park. It's um, our annual Halloween program as well. It's going to be outdoors this year. So Fisherween, I love this graphic that our PR person, Erin, made. Uh, she, this catfish, I just love it. And, and there's going to be shirts available too with this catfish on it. But you do need to register for that, which you can do on our website, gclibrary.com. Uh, I don't know off the top of my head how many spots are open, but there's a limited number of spots. So if you want to bring your kids to that, please register. And uh, if you have any questions or comments during the program, please just post those and we'll ask our guests, Minnie Sheeler and Judy, at the end of the program. And I know there's also some door prizes available that you can pick up at the library for the first three people to comment. And I see we already have comments from Sheila and Cindy, so you are two of the three. But anyone else, uh, there's a third uh, prize left that will be available at the library and uh, anyone else if you just have questions or comments uh, don't hesitate to share but uh, I'm going to turn it over to you Judy and um, okay. see you at the end of the program. Well good evening everyone and thank you for joining us with Know It to Grow It. Tonight's topic is Healing Gardens with Minnie Sheeler and she did her master's thesis on this topic and I know it's going to be really fascinating. Um, uh, the last few years well couple of decades, I guess, of my career, I worked in healthcare and visited a lot of hospitals. And I noticed that a lot of the hospitals were taking a special care to make different gardening areas um, within their facilities. And I wondered if that was kind of a thing. And so Minnie's going to tell us all about that thing tonight. So she's also got some fun news about what's going on at Garvin Woodland Gardens. So she'll be up with us in just a minute. Now, our next Know It to Grow It will be on Wednesday, November 17th at 6 p.m. One of our Garland County Master Gardeners, Jamie Wilkerson, is going to be presenting Homesteading 101. Uh, Jamie has been homesteading for years, and I think that the principles that they use would help us all in this modern world where we can, you know, kind of step back a little bit and... Um, do something on our own and maybe not buy it at the grocery store and and I think it's going to be a really interesting topic. As Paul said, we're going to have door prizes for the first three people who question or comment, so one more. And um, they, they can be picked up at the library tomorrow anytime. Now if you're interested in becoming a master gardener, there's still time. You can pick up a an application at the Garland County Extension Office at 236 Woodbine. We're asking that those applications be returned by November the 15th and our 2022 class will start in February. I can't believe 2022 is here already. Now if you haven't stopped by the library and checked out the new pollinator garden project, you really need to do so because it's really cool. The library staff and the Garland County Master Gardeners are creating a haven for birds, beads, and butterflies, and it's coming along beautifully, and it can be viewed through the uh, observation window. As always, I want to thank the Garland County Library. I think they're the best sponsor ever, and just something like the, the catfish fishing tournament, it, that's just what they do for our community, and I think it's so great we've got a library that's so involved. So now on to the show. Minnie Sheeler has a Master's of Science in Horticulture from Kansas State University. She's been an avid gardener since she could hold a trowel. She became interested in landscape design aspects through a close family friend who was a landscape architect, architect based out of Washington, D.C. 
While she was studying for her master's degree, she worked as a landscape designer as well as with the K-State Research and Extension and also the Denver Zoological Garden. After graduating, she moved to Kansas City to be close to her family and taught high school science for eight years. In 2014, she had a little change. She followed her passion for gardening and design and moved to Hot Springs with her fur babies. And she is now the garden manager at Garvin Woodland Gardens, where she is able to apply her knowledge and artistic talent in both horticulture and design. So tonight we welcome Minnie Sheeler. Hi, good to see you all. Thanks for having me. Okay, so um, tonight's program is going to be about healing gardens, which is what I did my uh, master's thesis on. And my study was on what makes a garden healing and then also what it is that you can do at home to kind of create these healing spaces. So I'm going to apply both those principles after I give you all just kind of a sneak peek of upcoming events that, that are going on at Garden Woodland Gardens. Uh, give you an idea of what we're doing, what you can come out and see, and um, totally come in and visit us and, and see what's going on. Okay, so my contact information is below. What we're going to talk about today is that healing gardens and how to create that healing garden space. Again, my name is Minnie Sheeler, Garvin Woodland Gardens, garden manager, and you can contact me at mhsheeler at uart.edu. My phone number is also on the website, but I'm more likely to quickly respond to emails. I'm away from my desk quite frequently. So if you all have any follow-up questions, anything that you really want to know about, please feel free to contact me. Some new and exciting things that we have going on at the gardens are going to be our um, ANCRC grant that we've completed this year of the pavilion and surrounding areas. We actually have some uh, really cool aspects that I'm going to feature later in the program that incorporate those healing aspects uh, that I'm going to be speaking to. And so you'll be able to not only see them in practice in example photos from hospitals and other facilities, but from our facility as well. So you can come out and experience the space and, and really immerse yourself in it and, and get to feel that whole concept surrounding you. We have new children's garden sculptures that have just been installed literally yesterday. Um, pretty exciting, and I'm going to give you a sneak peek of those. And then this year, we also have our Winter Wonderland Fest that will be going on. Because of the infrastructure and unknowns associated with COVID, we really need to limit our guest experience to those daytime hours so we can control the crowds. And we will be open normal business hours from 10 a.m., with our last ticket at 5 p.m. and the garden cleared at 6. But we really want you to come out and see our amazing art displays that are going on. We have a great portion of the garden that's going to be um, an immersive art experience that I'll, I'll give you a little bit of a sneak peek of. So pavilion area we have redone and you can see that in this um, photo that we've redone a, a set of stairs where we used to just have that kind of nasty chip trail mix and made it a little bit more uh, user-friendly and convenient. This is Mother Goose, one of the new installations at the Children's Garden, the River Otter, the Wise Owl, what we're calling River Mates, of course, a Razorback, and this wonderfully beautiful sculpture of a reclining rabbit that is featured in its very own little um, cloister garden. So please come out and see those at the children's garden. For our holiday event this year, Winter Wonderland, we are focusing on the elements. And so we're going to be stringing up these wonderful elements to create a bubble wall to emulate water. We've got some fire trees that are going up in the sensory garden area some really spectacular sky banners that you can see 
that are strung between the trees to give that effect of the sunset or sunrise, whichever you would like to interpret that as. And the um, sort of interplay of those colors in the sunlight really gives a spectacular view. We've got a little bit of whimsy that we're throwing in with our fairy. She's coming back this year as well with sort of a, a, a new shiny coat on her. And we've also redone um, our sea dragon into an ice dragon that we're going to call serendipity. So please come out and see these beautiful installations that we've got going for you at the gardens. On to our main presentation. One of the things that we need to discuss first or that we need to identify if you will, is um, what does it mean to be healing? A lot of people have this idea that, you know, we have these spaces that are healing, but what does that really mean to us? So the relief from symptoms, a reduction of stress, and an increase of that individual sense of well-being. So really what it is, is I walk into a space and I feel better. That is what it means to be healing. What is stress? Well, we all can define that for ourselves. We really don't need a definition. We know what it feels like. Um, but that is any factor that's going to cause you um, either mental or physical tension. And so it, it, it's something that can be environmental, it can be physical, or it can be mental in origin. It's any of those factors. And what we're looking at for a healing garden is the reduction of that stress. So there have been a lot of what we call environmental scientists who have studied these um, effects. And this field is called environmental psychology. And that idea is how does your environment, how does your physical surroundings actually impact you physically and psychologically? And there's some really great research out there, um, namely by the Kaplans um, and Ulrich. Um, they've done some great studies on how physical environments aid in the recovery from stress. And so in their studies, they looked at those really hard stresses of recovering from surgery. And what they looked at was the view from the hospital window and how that actually influences people. Where they got these ideas at, where they got these influences is from these ancient ideas of gardens as a healing space. This isn't something new. I mean, we see this all over the ancient world these things that we call cloister gardens. Um, the monks the monks would use them as, as meditation areas. Um, the churches would recreate them as these sort of essential spaces as a paradise garden. And even in the 1920s, they, they discovered that people with tuberculosis uh, would recover much more quickly when they were exposed to the outdoor environment. Now, we all know that there's other factors that are involved with that, but there is still a link between being exposed to that environment, that outdoor environment, nature, and that sense of reduction of stress and allowing for a physical body to recover more quickly. And so all of these have led to this modern idea of a healing garden. We see these very, very frequent and uh, frequently in recovery centers. And so what do I mean by a recovery center? Well, of course, when you're recovering from any kind of a surgery and have a long-term stay at a facility, or if you are at a long-term stay facility for some sort of a, an ailment such as Alzheimer's or dementia, they have these gardens that they've put into place. And they use some of the principles that we're going to talk about today to really ground the people who are in these uh, recovery centers and also help them to reduce the stress and recover or just be more comfortable. So one of the aspects that helps to create a healing garden is this idea of sense of space. And the sense of space is not only a visual idea, but it also pulls in all of your other senses, your sense of smell, your sense of hearing, touch, taste, all of those things are pulled into. And that's why we like it. Um, one of the things that we look at when we look at whether or not something is a healing space 
is the complexity. And so what the complexity refers to are the number of elements that are found in a space. And you can have highly complex spaces and highly simplistic spaces. So in this scene that we see before us, um, there is a level of complexity with the rocks and the mountains and the water and the different textures and the different green that comes into play. And so that complexity is what makes this either a desirable or an undesirable scene to many people. Focality is where you create some sort of a focal point. And what I mean by that is something to focus your attention on. Now we've got a spectacular image here of Mount Fuji reflected in a lake and, and quite obviously your attention is going to be drawn to this image of the mountain in the background. That, that's our main focal point. And there are a few things that draw our attention to it, such as the contrasting colors and the height and the directionality of the clouds and the horizontality of the different um, planes that lead up to it with the lake and the trees. And so those things all focus our attention on that single point. Depth is another factor, and this is uh, either actual or implied distance. And so there are a few ways to play with this. This is an actual depth um, image. And so this one shows mountain ranges in Vietnam. So you can see these immense mountains with those fields in front and really get that idea that you can see off into the distance. The ground surface texture is another factor that influences how we feel, how comfortable we are with a specific environment. And it's whether it's going to be rough or smooth. If it's something that we feel like we can walk on, we're more comfortable with it. If it's something that we feel like is going to be rocky, uh, we're less comfortable with it. And so I, I think most of you will recognize um, a scene like this as, as something really from uh, the old windows background. Um, and we had on our computer screens with this beautiful, even feel. <clears throat> really looks inviting. You can run out into it and not really come across any hazards. Which brings us to our perceived threat. So our sense of safety, whether or not we feel safe in a space. This image always makes me want to throw up. So if you notice in the top right, on that peak, there is a person standing out there with their arms splayed wide open, ready just to fall right off the edge into oblivion. So that makes me uncomfortable. Some people would find that exhilarating. I am really more of the I need a fence type woman. So this is my comfort level for that perceived threat. I could go out on this. I would crawl, not going to lie, but I would make it to the end. I would possibly stand up and look out, maybe. So we've got this whole idea of that perceived threat. The more comfortable a person feels, the more likely they are to not only have a reduction of stress, but also come into the space and really experience it. Another factor that comes into play is this deflected vista, which is the half-revealed view. And so it's this idea of this winding trail that walks through the woods. You see a lot of this if you come to the gardens. We don't try to have a lot of straight trails, and we do that for a reason. It makes you feel less inclined to become tired if you have somewhere that you feel that you're going to go and it's going to reveal sort of this hidden scene around the corner. It's that curiosity, it's that, that human intention to figure out what's just around the corner. We all have it. It's, it's playing off psychology. So it's one of those factors that really comes into play in a healing garden. That deflected vista, or sorry, that, um, that creation of that mystery really draws us into the, uh, the scene. And Again, water, actual or implied. So we're looking at either dry creek bed, maybe a fountain, could be an actual water feature flowing through. 
and that's something that helps to relax and calm. The sound of water is extremely soothing to the human psyche. So it's one of those things that if we can see, really feel and experience that water, that uh, we enter that healing state. Color is a huge influencing factor as well on that environment. So when we look at our environment in nature, when we look at what influences and what creates that healing space, it's not just about those physical aspects of plants taking up space, of the trail moving through, of the flowers that are there. It's also about the color of the space around you. And so these have psychological impacts, interesting enough. Um, if you've ever delved into it, uh, we've all heard of aromatherapy, but not a lot of us have really delved into color theory or color therapy, which is pretty interesting. I know that some of us have heard about the idea of, oh, well, they paint the hallways of schools or insane asylums certain colors to really encourage those people to experience a certain emotion. So what I'd like you to do, and that's hard because we're online. I can't necessarily see your responses, but I want you just to like jot down or just like mentally think of one or two emotions that come to the forefront as you look at each of the following colors. And I'm hopeful that everybody has like a monitor that is, is um, reflective of the colors that I actually have to show you. So you're not getting something weird. I will have the name of the color on there. So if you are getting an off color, you'll at least know what I'm talking about. There we go. So the impact of colors isn't just a psychological impact. Um, it actually has these physiological responses with certain colors that occur as well. And um, that's called color psychology. There's a whole field of study that's on this stuff. It's pretty amazing. Fast food restaurants totally took note. So did schools. So did insane asylums. But they went the wrong direction in certain instances. And we'll talk about why. Okay, red. Most people, when they see red, ha, huh, literally see red. So it's one of those very passionate powerful colors. It's the color of aggression, of danger, of war, and sometimes of love. We see this in Valentine's. We see this expressed with our hearts that we send. Um, it's a passionate color. It's something that actually influences us physiologically as well as psychologically. It increases your heart rate. It's going to increase your respiration and raises your blood pressure. I don't need to get into the details on why that's important. We can all use our imagination. It's seen as a stimulating color. It's also seen as having both positive and negative aspects, um, such as the signal danger. In nature, if you see red, typically that's a sign of danger. If you come across a snake and it has a red band on it, yeah, you better leave that one alone. You don't want to touch that. Just let it be. Orange. Orange is another color that has some connotations uh, with the food industry. If you haven't noticed, McDonald's has those nice red and orange and yellow colors on the inside. So does Burger King. So does KFC. So why is that? Well, orange is seen as color of encouragement, happiness, creativity, and enthusiasm. It also speeds your eating. It's seen as an energetic color. It's a hurry up color. It's a Gobble your food down as fast as you can and go get some more color. It's actually an appetite stimulant. So if you have a big meal that you've made and you want people to eat a lot, serve it on some orange plates. It's also associated with social events and youth attention to draw, or sorry, youth at, as a uh, factor to draw attention to something. Um, one of the very unique things is that in our society, it's seen as being flamboyant and attention seeking, but in other societies, it's actually seen as a spiritual color. So just one of those kind of switches between what we see and what other cultural experiences are. Yellow. 
We all think of yellow as sunny, as happy, as joyous. Um, it's also seen as a color of intellect and energy. So yellow is seen as one of those colors that, again, is stimulating. It's stimulating to the mind. It really creates that sort of happy energy. It creates that um, idea of movement and sort of creativity. Amazingly enough, yellow is the most visible to the human eye. And one of the things that they teach us whenever, um, if you're an educator, you've probably heard this before, that if you print black print on yellow paper, it's more visible to the human eye than the white paper with black print on it. And so that's something that's used frequently for people who have some sort of a visual impairment. It really draws that, um, that contrast out. Yellow symbolizes enlightenment. In our society, you've all heard the term, you yellow-bellied coward. So it's a cowardice thing. But it actually previously represented honor and loyalty until we kind of corrupted that in the States. Interesting side note to that. It was sort of used as an ironic statement, and then it took hold. Um, it's one of those that the press, the media, had really kind of grabbed hold of that color and changed the meaning of it in our society. So there you go. Green. Green is a color that we very frequently associate negatively with green with envy. It's also a color that we associate with life and vitality. So it has these two very opposing characteristics. Most of the time we associate it with life, with nature and harmony. And what's very interesting is that green is one of those colors that has the most variance um, or one of the most variants on the visible spectrum. And so different societies actually have many different names for the color green. We are not one of them because of the fact that we are an industrialized society, but um, in other societies where they rely on the prairie or on the fields or on hunting and gathering, there are more than one name for that color green. What's really great about it is it is actually a physiologically relaxing color. And so it not only is restful to the eye, but it's restful to the mind and to the body. There's a reduction of your stress level when you are observing the color green. It's considered to be a healing color because of this factor. In our society, it can symbolize love, trust, loyalty, and truth, but it can also symbolize that whole idea of jealousy, green with envy, and materialism as green, money, gonna seek that green. So there's that juxtaposition of what kind of innately we feel, and then what we've been pressed to feel from our cultural stance. So you're going to notice a little bit of that influence as you move through um, this color theory. I find it pretty astounding how much we relate what we have learned through our societal experience with what our, our sort of instinctual responses are. Very, very compelling, I think, as far as um, that juxtaposition there. Blue. I love it. I had a conversation not too long ago with a friend of mine who's a musician. And I said, you know, what is it about all these songs that talk about the color blue? And I, you know, I was thinking back to recently how there's all these different songs that I've heard that reference blue. And, you know, blue is that color that is signifying that like peaceful, spiritual, compassionate side of people. But it's also signifying that idea of sadness in our culture. And so blue has so many different nuances and resonances within what we hear and what we understand. It's quite interesting. Again, blue is a relaxing color. 
you're going to see a theme here that most of those colors that are on the cool end of the spectrum are going to be relaxing colors and those colors that are on the warm end of the spectrum those are going to be those very stimulating colors blue actually has been shown to lower blood pressure lower heart rate and really help people become um, kind of contemplative this is a color that if you're going to create a room or a space for meditation this is a good color to use and the reason I mention this is that remember these colors don't only refer to what you can do in your home but also the colors of the flowers the colors of your decorations all of those different things that you can pull out into the landscape so blue creates that contemplative mood and is associated with um, stability and again as I've mentioned earlier that uh, melancholy depression Purple, what purple is, is it's a uh, mix of those two emotionally, psychologically opposing colors of red and blue. So you have that very vibrant, very energetic, very passionate color of red, and then you have blue that's a contemplative, calm color. So when I refer to purple, it's not the spectral color. That's violet. We'll refer to that just in a second. Purple is considered to be the color of uh, wisdom, dignity, independence, royalty, and it actually helps to induce relaxation and sleep. And so the reason that I mention this is that purple is the color that you would paint your wall. Violet is the color that you would see from a projection of a light, if that makes sense to you all. Purple decreases sensitivity to pain. There have been many studies that have been done to show this, um, this sort of like decrease of, you know, put your hand in a bucket of ice water. How long can you stand it if you're looking at the color purple versus other colors? Very interesting. And it symbolizes historically that royalty dignity. Um, but because of that, because it helps to symbolize royalty, it also has been very well associated with the idea of arrogance. Um, I hate to admit it, my favorite color is purple, in case you haven't noticed by my hair. Um, yeah, so there's that. And then we have violet that apparently doesn't want to show up. Um, it is that pure spectral hue. And it's considered to be lighter than purple. It's considered to be more of a pure hue than purple is. Um, it's seen as being something that is spiritual and compassion, creativity, mystery, and magic, which is why a lot of times when you see references to different, um, like if you think back to when you were a kid and you saw like the wizards and sorcerers and all of those other things and they had like purple hats on, that's why it's that idea of tying into that whole idea of magic and mystery. It is also a relaxing color and it's associated with higher consciousness. And um, one of these very interesting things is a lot of people will actually use this violet light to help with meditation and to kind of try to access that higher consciousness within themselves. Um, because of that, because of that idea of being so focused on that higher plane, it's also associated with aloofness. Pink is an interesting color. Um, it's seen as a color of innocence. It's seen as a color of youth and vulner vulnerability and hope. It's also seen as immaturity. Um, pink can be a calming color, and this is where I, I speak to that. So pink is one of those colors that had been used traditionally to um, paint the walls of the insane asylums and also the schools. And what they found is that different hues of pink affect people in different ways and that there can be too much pink and it can actually cause ag agitation if it's, if it's something that people are exposed to for too long over a certain amount of time. And the, the color of pink that they had used back in the 1970s when this color theory first came out was kind of an orangey pink, like the color of the sunset. They thought that, that was calming 
because of the studies that were done, which it is in small doses, but it actually incited more aggression in the um, in the people who were kept in those facilities or or participated in those facilities than than a white wall, which is why in modern times we've gone back to that white. Um, it's also associated with femininity. Um, and as I mentioned earlier with immaturity, white is seen as a, a very um, polarized color. So it's seen as being pure, innocent, and sometimes even seen as being a sign of integrity. It can be a calming color. It's been shown to have those physiological as, uh, um, aspects of, of being calming, of helping to reduce the heart rate and the respiration rate and all of those. But people a lot of times associate that with bland, cold, and sterile, sterile because of the fact that we have leaned towards our hospitals and those spaces being white. Black is a color that in our society also has a negative connotation. It really represents sophistication, glamour, efficiency, and substance if you look at color theory. But um, one of the negative aspects or could be considered negative as aspects is the idea of um, suppressing emotion. Because black suppresses emotion, it's also typically associated with the mourning period. And that's why we have that negative connotation where black really seems to be this sort of color of death. Um, the idea behind it originally wasn't that it was a color of death or um, a color of mourning. It was the idea that, okay, if I'm wearing black, I'm helping to suppress my emotions and become calmer. And um, that's one of those little societal cues that, that we've developed over time. Um, again, this is our American society that has, has sort of created these connotations with that counter to what the uh, color theory research has shown. It's very interesting that juxtaposition of our physiological and psychological truths versus what culture tells us. So when we look at our spectral analysis, um, you can see that green is pretty encompassing on that spectrum. So we have very, very few of that, that violet and those, those purple hues and a lot more of those greens to red uh, in the spectrum. Of course, that's one of the um, kind of ideas behind this, uh, this color theory is nature has a lot of green with it. One of those things that influences us as well is going to be the amount of sun that we receive for a couple of reasons. Um, and one of the impacts that our environment has on us that's a negative impact is that, that lack of exposure to sun um, and the outdoor environment. So as we've become a more industrialized society, we've, we've definitely become more um, indoor associated and so we have less of a tolerance to those extremes of temperature and light we have an increase in depression and um, vitamin d deficiencies we also have an increase in headaches migraines and fatigue and those have all been linked to this whole idea of not having enough natural sunlight or those those outdoor um, light rays so sunlight is actually needed for our biological processes in some instances. For example, the um, seasonal dysphoric disorder where people get depressed. So the physician will actually prescribe either a sunlight or a sun lamp in order to help people recover from that because of those physiological and biological needs for that sunlight. So the recommendation is 15 to 30 minutes. Um, and then an increase in the winter months whenever the sun angle is lowered and you're getting less sunlight. So another influencing factor on how we experience our spaces is um, that olfactory sense. And the idea is that scent can actually trigger memory and that different odors elicit different responses. So I'm just really briefly going to buzz through 
this idea of aromatherapy. And the reason I'm going to really briefly buzz through it is because there's a ton of information out there. A lot of us are very familiar with us. It's becoming ingrained in our society. And a lot of us even use aromatherapy every day in our homes with the different scents that we bring in. But here's just a, a brief explanation of what those fragrances are, how they influence us, and, you know, how to create that environment, not only indoors, but outdoors, that, that elicits those healing responses. And so we've got lavender. Lavender is one of those that's traditionally been seen as calming and restful. Um, it has this passive alertness and uh, reduces anxiety. It's frequently used on a little drop, stick a, cute, or a, a cotton ball in your ear to help um, treat headaches. And it reduces heart rate and blood pressure. Peppermint is not only a tea, but it helps to increase concentration. It's been listed as having antidepressant effects and reduces heart rate and blood pressure. Rose is very nostalgic. It's been seen as something that reduces anxiety and causes a decrease in heart rate and blood pressure. So it's calming in that sense. Basil, amazingly enough, has been shown to increase sorry, concentration and have this um, sort of relaxation effect. Um, basil is one of those that I love the smell of it, never really understood why, but it's got all those uh, different positive notes to it. Rosemary, if we were doing this live, I would have you sniff that before we do the presentation because it helps to boost memory and also improves your concentration. Um, it helps with retention of new information. And rosemary oil does not smell anything like the herb rosemary. Amazingly enough, it smells very piney. And uh, it's also a great repellent for mosquitoes and ticks. I use it in my little home blend of um, my insect repellent. Sage is one that is used for mental clarity and calming relaxation, reduction of blood pressure is another impact of sage. And there are many different sages that we can find that we can use in the landscape and they um, all have different scents, but they have that same underlying uh, oil, that aromatic oil that's within them. Thyme is one that helps to reduce anxiety as well. If you apply it topically, it has an interesting effect of increasing blood pressure. So that's one that is really recommended for more of the aromatherapy um, aspects, unless you're going for the opposite effect of sort of that invigorating. Oops, sorry about that. Juniper is going to be um, calming but also give you that sort of refreshing energy. And lilac is seen as a nostalgic that eases anxiety. Pine is going to be an uplifting fragrance. It's one of those that has that mood enhancing. And I know it's one of my favorite fragrances. Um, I love the smell of that fresh cut pine tree in the house. Christmas time, it's nostalgic for me as well. So it's one of those memory triggering ones for myself, which some of these are going to also kind of trigger that nostalgia for you all. Lemon helps to reduce stress, but it does cause an increase in heart rate. So other senses that are influencing you um, are the sounds. So it's this idea of running water and these mid-tone chimes. And so it's looked at as the key of C, um, bird song, wind blowing through the leaves, which is, it, there's actually a technical term for that called citharism. Um, we have shirts at the garden that have that word on it. It's pretty amazing. So it's this idea of having not only the sounds, but also the touch and the feel of the ground plane, the texture of the plants, what you're walking on, the benches, everything has that impact. Are you in the sun? Are you not in the sun? All of those different things kind of play together. Um, taste is another sense that you can pull in, but that's 
only if you know the plants. We don't all want to go out and randomly eat little brown mushrooms. Don't know what's going to happen. Don't do it. Um, there are a lot of ornamental plants that are actually either mild irritants or, or toxins. And so we have to be very careful about encouraging that or encouraging it only in specific spaces. So bringing it all together. It's this idea that stimulation of the senses is essential. You've got to feel comfortable and relaxed. You're going to use those colors and fragrances to elicit your desired emotional, emotional responses in that space. And then you really want to keep nature as a muse to help create that unity. You know, draw yourself into nature. Don't make your stamp so obvious that it's just a patio with a giant fire pit and giant stadium wall around you. It's bringing yourself into nature and creating that unity. So I've got a few examples of different um, hospitals that have really melded these well together. Uh, here we have that upper Chesapeake Cancer Center that has a meditation maze as well as different levels of privacy that are created throughout those gardens and different pathways. Celebration Health Garden. Again, that idea of water, those different levels of privacy, and that idea of that enclosed space that's semi-private, even though there's all those windows around, there's those screening elements. Hopkins Center for the Arts. This is one that's very easily achievable in a home garden with a nice fountain in the middle, a little bird bath. This idea of kind of that cloister wall surrounding the circle that you can walk through and then two entrances. So at the gardens, over the past year, we've installed um, what we're calling our secret garden. This is a view from the pavilion. In the middle, you'll see a dark blob. That dark blob is actually a fountain that's been installed. The idea is that you have these screen views of the fountain leading off of a main trail. So this trail goes from the pavilion to the restroom. Um, this did just used to be chip mix, but we've upgraded it to include some field stone. The trail that comes off of that field stone is a smaller trail. It's a winding trail and creates these hidden views so that as you walk into the space, you're sort of opened up to the idea of having this little fountain, this little water feature that's in the center. There are three benches that are on order um, that will go around the space to create a nice meditative area where you can sit and enjoy the sound of the water trickling and ignore the people walking past you. I designed it with the idea that there would be a wall of screening plant material that will grow in over the next few years to really give you this idea of enclosure and comfort and seclusion. So how do you do this at home? You can do this with fences and comfortable seating and dry creek beds and canopies. You can do this with different planting materials, with different textures. Um, it's pretty easy to even accomplish this in a small space to create your healing garden um, by creating your pathway where it's meandering almost like it's a water feature, even if you don't have that at your um, disposal to have a running water feature and create these little pocket areas that you can sort of accent with those fragrances and those colors that you really want to use to draw out the emotion that you're looking to create. If you don't have a yard, use some pots. You can use the color of the pot itself and the plant material that goes inside the pots as well as the arrangement and around your space create this nice, cozy little atmosphere. So it's doable, whatever sort of area that you're in, you can make it work. All right, that's the end of my show. I will now take questions. Hello, I'm not gonna start talking when I'm muted this time. <laughs> Well, uh, thank you, Minnie. Um, some beautiful pictures there. Um, let's see. We did have a few comments. Um, Regine, um, at, when you were showing the color, said that must be why we eat so much on Thanksgiving. <laughs> um, 
Judy, do you have any questions for or, or comments for me? No, I don't. I'll tell you, I, I am really interested. I'm I'm working on a, a property myself, and I do think that we all can do a little something just to ease our stress these days because, man, there's a bunch of it out there. And so uh, I really enjoyed hearing about the colors and the scents, and I'm going to try to do a little bit of my own little zen thing going on. I have a friend, Teresa Wither. She's a cart driver out at Garvin, and she always says that uh, the gardens are her zen place, and I can really see why. Uh, so, no, great program, and I really enjoyed it. Really enjoyed it. Got to learn a lot. And what's funny is when you said rose, my grandmother rose wore a rose uh, lotion. Mm -hmm. And whenever I smell a rose, I think about my grandmother and I think that's awful, awfully cool. But I, I do have one thing that I forgot to mention in my intro and I hope I'm not going to take away from Minnie's program. But I do want to uh, recognize one of our past presenters. Randy Atkinson and his team at the um, Garland County Recycling Center. Uh, they have been um, noticed and recognized by the Arkansas Recycling Coalition. And I have the paper right here. And I just wanna say how proud I am of Garland County for taking the time to recycle. We, um, our landfills are, are filling up and we're not gonna have enough room when, when I don't have any kids, but a lot of people have little kids and a four-year-old when they're 30 there might not be any landfill unless we do recycle so i'm really really proud of garland county for stepping up and doing the right thing and so um who's won our prizes tonight paul thanks for sharing that judy um oh we had uh sheila and cindy and it looks like well do you have a fourth prize you can offer judy? yes we have I'll we had Millie and Regine. Their comments came in at the exact same time. Uh, I'll have to bring the fourth one um, on Friday. I'm actually taking a day trip tomorrow and going to Moss Mountain uh, to P. Allen Smith's farm for lunch. So I'm excited about my day trip and I'll get the fourth. Who are we going to say come in on Friday? Let's see. On my end, it says it shows Regine listed second. So Regine, you'll wait till Friday. Yep. Um, but they both came in at six oh five million, Regine. So perfect. And I thank you for your comments, and I hope you enjoy your gift prizes. Absolutely. And we did have a question come in um, from Regine uh, for for you, Minnie. She says, "Do you do house calls for garden design, perhaps?" And uh, well, two questions. So, do you do house calls for garden design? Well, I used to. Um whenever I, I had a kind of a side business, um, it's something that, that I can get approval for and look into. Yeah. And then our second question is, do you have any suggested reading? Um, let's see. I really, as far as lay person goes, I, I'm a little bit out of the loop on that. Um, let me get back to you with those. Absolutely. And you can, uh, post these in the comments to your suggestions and we might have a lot of them at the library for checkout. Um, and then uh, we had a comment from Cindy who says, thank you. So very interesting. Great. Thank you. Awesome. Thanks everybody for joining us tonight. Um, come back for homesteading. We'll figure out <clears throat> how we can take care of ourselves in these times. Yes. What's the date of our next program, Judy? It is Wednesday, November 17th at 6 p.m. Right. All right. Well, thank you everyone for watching. And uh, this is recorded on Facebook and YouTube. So be sure to share with your friends if you enjoy. And Thanks, Minnie. Great program. Thank you. Thank you all for having me as a guest. Absolutely. Have a good night. Good night. Good night, everybody.